Uh, we're going to continue uh, with the nativity, the Christmas story this morning. And so uh, if you brought your Bibles, I invite you to open them up to Luke chapter 1. It's going to be on the screen also, but I've asked my assistant here to set the stage for us. So go ahead. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, many tried to th Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. I'm going to give her a hand for reading for us this morning. I bribed her by telling if you read today, you get to pick who reads next week. So just beware. You might get tapped on the shoulder. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but I have a question. Did any of you grow up in a house that had a statue of Mary? Any of you grow up in a house that had a, a, maybe a picture of Mary? Did any of you grow, grow up in a household where, where Mary was prayed to, or maybe you had special meals or feast for Mary? Uh, I remember a time in my life when, when Amy and I were first uh, talking about getting pregnant. We went and worked uh, with uh, uh, the Missionaries of Charity, uh, uh, an order of Mother Teresa in Dallas, and the, these deeply devout uh, nuns that were there found out, you know, like, I, I don't, are all nuns like this? They found out that Amy hadn't had kids yet, and was like, hey, you need to get pregnant. And they gave Amy, a, like, didn't they give you, like, an icon of Mary and pray to this Mary? And so, like, uh, maybe that is your tradition, but I, but I want you to know, like, that was never my tradition growing up. Like, I would go to a friend's house, and they would have a statue of Mary, and I would, what is this for? Like, I, I, you know, it just wasn't a part of my faith stream. Um, but there has been like a fascination with Mary for, for thousands of years. Uh, it, it's permeated every part of art and everything you could imagine, uh, from, from poetry to music and, and, and art. I want to show you, here are some of the images throughout thousands of years of Mary. Just keep scrolling through some of those, Caleb. Some of the artists you see here are Da Vinci and Raphael, Galini, Caravaggio, even, even modern artists like Dali and Henry Moore. Mary has captured our attention and a focus. This last image is from, uh, I don't know how to say it in Latin, but it means piety. It's actually in the Vatican, and, and I've actually been there. I've seen it. The, the full piece is over seven feet tall, and it is Mary holding Jesus. The sculpture was created by Michelangelo. It's in the Vatican, uh, and it's actually the only piece that Michelangelo ever signed himself. And this is just a close-up of Mary's face. Like I said, for thousands of years, like we have been, man, 
there, there's been this fascination, this interest in Mary, and, and art is one of the most, like, you, you could do a whole, like, art history of images and icons and statues of Mary. Even uh, all the way back to the second and third century, we have images. And just some interesting Bible trivia, trivia for you. I can't prove this, but the legend says that Luke, the author of our gospel, actually interviewed Mary for this. They, and Luke says, hey, this, these are these are eyewitnesses accounts of what happens, and Luke includes some like incredible details that no other gospel includes about Mary. One of the things Mary will say a, a couple of times is that she's going to hold these things in her heart. She's going to hold these. How would Luke know these things if he had not talked to her? So I, I can't prove it, but that's, that's part of the legend. And the legend continues that one of the very first images, pictures of Mary was actually drawn by Luke himself. So why this fascination with Mary? Why does she get all of this attention and devotion? And and so I just want to take a few minutes and let's just look briefly at her life, especially from the passages that we read today. Uh, I'll start by asking this question. How old were you when you got engaged? How old were you when you got engaged? 23, 18. I think I got engaged at 20. Was I 21? Okay. Oh, I was 22. Oh, I was 21. You were 22. Okay. I think that's too young. <laughs> you know, like some of you got engaged at 18. Like, wow. So in the first century, like engagements, betrothals, those, those kind of things, in, in the first century culture, um, usually you would be betrothed or, or put into an engagement when you were 13 years old. I don't even know if that's legal today, right? Like 13. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's just hard for us to imagine. Uh, so my daughter who just read a minute ago, she's how old? I think she's 12. She's 12, right? In three months, you'll be 13. I, I should ask her, like, Harper, how would you feel about getting married? She would kill me. <laughs> Not if I kill you first. <laughs> but let's take it a step further. What if... Not only is your 13-year-old engaged, what if your 13-year-old says, hey, and by the way, I'm pregnant. This is one of those interesting things when you spend time with, with people who don't have a faith or, faith or who are non-Christians. Like, have you ever really tried to explain the virgin birth to someone who is not a believer? You know, because instantly their the first thought is, well, you know, Joseph and Mary, they probably just like, no, 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 that's not what happened. That's not what scripture, like somehow the, the creator of everything created again through this teenager who had never known a man. But like if you've ever tried to explain the virgin birth to, to a non-believer like, and found it difficult, imagine how difficult it must have been for Mary to try to explain how she was pregnant. I guarantee Mary had a harder time. How did Mary explain this to her friends? How did Mary explain this to her neighbors? It says that she goes and she spends a bunch of time with Elizabeth. Can you imagine why she would want to get out of town? You think she got looks or stares or comments how did she explain to her friends and neighbors? But like, also think about it. Like, what did she say <laughs> to Joseph? This guy that she's engaged to be married. Matthew tells us that when Joseph finds out she's pregnant, what's his plan? His plan is to quietly break off the engagement. You see, like, it's... Maybe we miss this sometimes, but I, but I think um, Mary was not in favor at, at this moment. 
She, was, she wasn't in anybody's favor. She wasn't in her parents' favor. She wasn't in Joseph's favor. She wasn't in her friends' and, and neighbors' favor. She wasn't in society's favor or cultural's favor. Like, and yet, the angel, when Gabriel comes and speaks to Mary, he tells her t- twice, calls her favored one of God. You have found favor with God. How is this possible? She's not in anybody's favor. How has she found favor with God? It makes me wonder, why her? You ever ask this question? Like, why her? If I was going to choose someone for the Savior of the world to be born to, I would choose someone like Elizabeth. Right? Zachariah and Elizabeth are all stars in faith. They're faith rock stars. They're both from priestly tribes. They've spent their whole life being incredibly obedient to God in every way, shape, and form. They're they're wise and mature. And by the way, they're also married. In Luke, he interweaves Elizabeth and Mary's story together. I don't know if you've noticed this, right? Tells a little bit about Elizabeth, then tells a little bit about Mary, then tells a little bit about John, then tells a little bit about Jesus. Their stories are interwoven. When they receive news, receiving the news that Elizabeth would get pregnant, her husband, Zachariah, do you remember how he responds to the angel? Gabriel comes to Zachariah and to Mary in Luke. You remember how Zachariah replies when the angel says, hey, you're, you're surprised. Your wife Elizabeth is pregnant. You remember what he says? How can this happen? How can this happen? She's too old. We're too old for this. And it's interesting that uh, uh, Mary's response actually is pretty similar. If you look back just a few verses, it says, uh, the angel comes and says, Uh, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And Mary asked the angel, echoing Zachariah's reply, How can this happen? I'm not too old. I'm just a virgin. Almost identical questions, but Gabriel's response is incredibly different. If you remember back, Zachariah, after questioning Gabriel, Gabriel really doesn't seem to appreciate it at all. When Zachariah says, how's this possible? The angel Gabriel says, don't you know who I am? I'm Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. And for not believing, guess what's going to happen to you? Like somehow Gabriel sees in Zachariah's question, disbelief. And for his disbelief, he uses the ability to speak. And, and we see later even to hear. Like For Zachariah's question, he gets scolding and discipline, but Mary gets something incredibly different. She asks essentially the same question, hey, how can this happen? And instead of scolding and disciplining her, Mary gets a long explanation. Like, it's almost like Gabriel, the angel from on heaven, is like, do I have to explain everything? And the angel gives this long response. Well, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. Like, the, the Spirit of, of God is going to come and overshadow you. And this baby, he's going to be holy, by the way. He's going to be the Son of God. And also, hey, by the way, Elizabeth is pregnant. Let me update you on that whole situation. Some of you are wondering, there's a song that goes around every Christmas, uh, Mary, Did You Know? Do you guys know this song? It's a horrible song. Yes, she knew. You know how she knew? Gabriel told her, (laughs) right? You're pregnant, and guess what? You're pregnant with the Son of God. Some of you are not listening because I just said, Mary, did you know it's a horrible song? I just lost you forever looking for a new church. To Mary's question, hey, how is this possible? How is this going to happen? The angel Gabriel also gives this one final sentence that that is so important. It's such an important part of the Christmas message. The last thing Gabriel tells to Mary is, for nothing is impossible with God. 
So the question remains for me, why Mary? Why her? Although Mary and Zachariah's responses appear to be very similar, there are a couple of key differences, and I just want to point them out in two scriptures. The first big difference is seen in Elizabeth and Mary's response. After finding out that she's going to be pregnant and finding out about Elizabeth's pregnancy, just a few verses later, Later, Mary travels to be with Elizabeth. That was the passage that Kathy read this morning. And, and when the two pregnant ladies come together, right, the children leap in the womb. John leaps in the womb. And Mary, I'm sorry, and then Elizabeth has this incredible response to Mary. It's an amazing scene. Elizabeth says in verse 45, I think I have it, I think I have it on the screen Elizabeth looks at Mary and says, you are blessed because you, what's that word? You believe that the Lord would do what he said. The, the truth is, like, even, even from Scripture, Mary is unextraordinary in almost every way. Uh, she, she, to our knowledge, she never performs any miracles. She, she may only say two lines in all of Scripture. She's only sparsely mentioned at all. She is unextraordinary in every way except this teenager. When Gabriel approached her, somehow believed that the Lord would do what he said believed in a way that Zechariah, the chief priest who'd spent his whole life in church, didn't. She took God at his word. And the evidence of her belief, and, and really I think Mary's shining moment is seen in her response to Gabriel. Look what she says in verse 38. Remember, Mary says to Gabriel, how is this possible? I've never known a man. And Gabriel explains to her, hey, nothing's impossible with God. And Mary responds with these incredible words. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. In Greek, that word servant is the word handmaid or, or bondsmaid. It, 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 it means female slave. On hearing the words of Gabriel, Mary says, I'm the Lord's slave. In a way, she said, the, she, her, her prayer wasn't, man, God, would your will be changed? But in her life, in her response, she said, may it be done in me. Like, I think her response echoes that of Isaiah. Remember what Isaiah said when the Lord has this incredible, when he has this incredible vision, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Which is just a statement of, of, of willingness, a statement of, of readiness, a statement of saying, please use me, and, and I love Mary, as a teenager, says, whatever God says, I accept. So why Mary? I've already mentioned, like, what we know about Mary from Scripture and Luke is, honestly, it's pretty unextraordinary and almost every way. Mary wasn't the most qualified. Uh, she was untested, unexperienced, and, and frankly, she was too young and immature for such a monumental moment. But Mary is given the last word, and as a statement of faith, declares her unreserved belief and readiness to be used for God's purpose. Why Mary? 
because she believed God and was ready to be used by him. You see, I think God enlists ordinary folks to a much larger project than our own lives. He sweeps us up into a pageant otherwise known as the kingdom of God. I love the way that, that the, the theologian William Barclay put it. He said, God does not choose a person for ease and comfort and selfish joy, but for a task that will take all that head and heart and hand can bring to it. Now here's the thing about Mary. God chose her, and I think he has chosen us also. It's easy to imagine that this incredible task of bringing, bringing all that, that the grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and all the hope of God falls on this teenager, but it doesn't just fall on her, it falls on us too. I think God has, if you will, impregnated us who claim to be his followers, who claim to be his children. He has given us his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness to bring about his life in this world, to bring about his will in this world, to give birth to his purpose. And we can pray which maybe is our frequent Christian prayer of today. God, your will be changed. Find somebody else. Use somebody else. Could, it make, could you relieve some of this and make it easier? People are talking about me. We can pray, God, your will be changed, or, or we can respond in the exact same way a teenage girl responded. Look at these words again. Remember what she said? I am the Lord's servant. When you woke up this morning, what were the words that went through your head? When you entered your workplace or into a difficult situation or, or even through this whole COVID season, what have been the words that have been running through your head? What if you echoed the words of a teenage girl all those years ago instead? What if you replaced all the worry and all the doubt and all the fear and all the anxiety with the, these simple words? I am the Lord's servant. What if the real meaning of Christmas wasn't about trees and wreaths and all of these other things? What if the real meaning of Christmas is about following the example of a teenage girl, believing God, and being ready to be used by him. Maybe we need to take the angel Gabriel's advice, especially as it relates to God's call for your life, for participation in his kingdom. You remember what the angel said, don't be afraid. Because nothing is impossible with God. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for your word, for its challenge. I thank you uh, for the example of Mary, the example of her faith and the, the example of her life, what it means. And, and I mean, we just, uh, we have an incredible witness to the life of faith in her. I, I don't think she should be the object of our devotion, but I think, God, she's an example for us to follow. And so, God, as we prepare to take communion, as we prepare to, to face our weeks coming up, let the words that, that, that continue to just live in our heads and in our hearts are, I am the Lord's servant. 
Let us wake every day believing you, trusting your word, and and let us wake every day readying ourselves to be used by you. Father God, we are your servant. And I think through the power of the Holy Spirit, your joy and your hope and your forgiveness have been somehow seeded into us. And so God, as your servants, may your will be done in us and through us. We love you, Father. And in your son Jesus' name, everyone together says,